Welcome to Mutual Exchange Radio, a project of the Center for a Stateless Society. I am your host, Zachary Woodman. My guest today is Fabio Rojas, a professor of sociology at Indiana University. Dr. Rojas is an expert who works on the sociology of political movements and social theory. He is the author of several books, including Theory for the Working Sociologist, Party in the Street, The Anti-War Movement and the Democratic Party After 9-11, and From Black Power to Black Studies, How a Radical Social Movement Became an Academic Discipline. He is also currently co-editing Context, the official magazine of the American Sociology Association. Today we discuss the economics, sociology, and ethics of another issue Dr. Rojas is passionate and an expert on, immigration and the open borders movement. We are discussing what a world with little to no immigration restrictions might look like and Dr. Rojas' case for why it might be preferable, both on economic and ethical grounds. Dr. Rojas addresses some of the most common objections to open borders from both the left and the right. He is a very knowledgeable expert on the sociology of immigration, as well as a passionate advocate for immigrant rights, and that really comes through in our conversation. So without further ado, here's Dr. Rojas. Welcome to this episode of Mutual Exchange Radio. Joining me today is Dr. Fabio Rojas, a professor of sociology at the University of Indiana. Hello, Dr. Rojas. Hello, how are you? I'm doing good. So today we are discussing open borders and your reasons for supporting them and what we can do to build a freer world of migration in the future. So let's start. What got you interested in issues of immigration and open borders more generally? Yeah, so uh, there wasn't one moment where I just woke up one day and had this opinion, uh, but it comes from a couple of different sources. So first of all, I'm very strongly classical liberal. I'm the kind of person who really believes in individual freedom and autonomy. I'm very interested in free markets and uh, the ability of people to live their lives the way they see fit. So I've been like that for a very long time. And uh, for most of my life, I never really thought about migration that much because I didn't know uh, the size of the problem. So maybe on an abstract level, I've always believed that people should be able to move across borders as they see fit, but it's not something that really caught my attention. Then a couple of different things happened. First of all, we saw the massive increase in um, deportations, uh, migration enforcement during, uh, this started during the Clinton era, started to escalate during uh, the Bush era, and then really escalated during the Obama era. And that started drawing my attention. Um, I knew people who were affected by immigration law. Some of them had been deported. So I put all these things together, and then I realized this was quite a serious problem. Um, somebody who's a good friend of mine, who's very influential the way I think about this, is an economist named Brian Kaplan. And, uh, you know, he's the kind of person who says, you know, if you really want to help the world's poor, you should definitely think about letting them migrate. It's easier to let them migrate than to fix their country. He has a lot of interesting arguments for open borders. We can go into that in a lot of detail. But putting these different things together, hearing kind of more intellectual arguments, having kind of very kind of um, classical liberal orientation to start with, and having known people who were affected by immigration enforcement made me realize this is an issue that really deserves a lot of attention. And then also, I've been somewhat affected by the uh, group of people known as effective altruists. I know if you've heard of these people, but effective altruism is the idea that if you want to do something good in the world, it should be evidence-based. It should have some sort of logic or reason to it. And once you realize that if you really are interested in helping people, um, probably one of the easiest things you could ever do for somebody, they'll have a direct, large impact on their lives, is letting them move to a wealthier country where things are better. So all these things together drew me uh, to the idea of open borders. And then the last couple of years, I've been very active in publicizing the idea of open borders throughout um, various mechanisms, like, um, for example, um, blogging, tweeting about it, uh, the Open Borders Information website run by V. Paul Nike and some other people uh, contributing there, doing television interviews, radio interviews. I've been interviewed a few times in the media about it. Um, last year, we had the first Open Borders Conference in Washington, D.C. that I helped organize with a group of people known as the Free Migration Project. That's a nonprofit run by David Bennion uh, and a number of other uh, immigration attorneys. And we're going to be doing it again in New York City this October. So if there are any New York area uh, listeners to your show, if you really want to meet people up close who really care about open borders a great deal, please come to our um, event. So that's kind of what drew me into it. And, uh, you know, 
And I think it just comes down to the following, which is that if you're, if you have strong opinions about individual freedom or liberty the way I do, um, and you were to say, what is the one thing people should know about that would really help improve the world, make poor people better, make lives better? Uh, immigration, liberalization is the way to go. Excellent. So uh, what is your five minute elevator pitch? Well, maybe not five minutes, maybe a little longer, but what's your, what's your short pitch for why open borders is so helpful and such a good idea? Yeah. So I can certainly give you a couple of minutes and we can dig into it and you can offer me criticisms, but here's, here's how it would go. I'd say, look, you know, every day people cross the border between Indiana and Illinois. They go to work in Chicago. The workday comes at the end and they go back. And every day people move back and forth, back and forth. Sometimes they move permanently. They may move from Wisconsin into Illinois, from Illinois to Indiana permanently. But this happens every day. Thousands, probably tens of thousands of people move back and forth every day. And it's okay. We know it's totally okay for people to move across political borders, right? And there are a lot of good reasons why. For example, if you need a job, you may need to move. Maybe if your your uh, spouse lives in Chicago and you live in Indianapolis, you might want to move from Indianapolis to Chicago. Um, maybe you simply like Chicago better than Indianapolis. There's a lot of really good reasons why you'd want to move. And every day that happens all the time and nobody gets upset about it. It's totally okay. So then you have to ask yourself, well, if it's okay for people to move from Oklahoma into Texas or from you know, Indiana and Illinois, why is it bad for people to move from Mexico to Texas? Why should we stop somebody from Canada who wants to live in New York City? Why is that? And once you realize that if it's okay for people to move between states within the country, why is it wrong for people to move between countries? So that's the kind of initial starting point, which is that if you really say that you have the right to live uh, your life as you see fit, that certainly includes moving from one town to another, from one state to another. And usually uh, when it comes to open borders, people say, ah, what about this problem or that problem? And once you uh, start listening to the criticisms and you start doing research on them, you say, well, for example, what about crime? This often comes up. People say, well, what if we had let in a lot of criminals? Well, first of all, they're criminals within the United States and they move around, but yet we don't shut the borders. We focus on the criminals instead. Um, but more importantly, a lot of research shows that immigrants tend to uh, be less criminally active than native born people. Um, you know, and once you start going through different objections, like, you know, will they, they be a drain on welfare? Will they be a drain on schools? Will they bring criminal behavior? And you just read the literature on it one at a time. You realize either uh, it's just simply not true. Yeah, that's first, the first thing. Or sometimes when it is true, the effect is relatively small. So when it comes to open borders and the right to migrate, I think the, um, the burden of proof is on the critic because I'm giving you something simple and easy to understand. I'm telling you that normally movement is okay. It shouldn't be illegal just because you're moving from Mexico into Texas. It should be legal. It helps the migrant. You know, they are getting, they're better off because they're getting a good job or living in a safer place. We're better off because those poor people who come in from poor countries, they do a lot of good jobs for us. They're the ones cutting your lawn. They're the ones cleaning your house. Some of them are talented. They may become doctors or lawyers in your society, and they're helping you again. They're customers. They will buy stuff. So they're helping us. And so in order for you to justify to me that I should prevent that from happening, you have to show me that there's some grave harm that's happening. And over and over again, when you look at the evidence and the data, you see that that harm simply isn't there. Though even when there are negative effects, and sometimes there are some negative effects of migration, they tend to be very small. Uh, they tend to be very modest. And so at the end of the day, I'm not really persuaded by most arguments in favor of restriction of migration. So there, there's a lot going on there. One of your big points is that there needs to be a moral parity between what we do to restrict citizens if they're having an effect on crime or whatever and what we do with non-citizens, correct? Right. So, you know, so th that's something that a lot of people have difficulty um, accepting. It's actually a very serious moral argument where I'm saying that the person who lives in Mexico or Canada is equal to me in moral terms. Right. So I don't get to boss them around. I don't get to tell them what to do. And if you accept that, 
then migration, the right to migrate flows very freely from that. But if you really believe that people in the country have more rights, they have the right to boss around other people, then it takes some effort to kind of get out of that mindset, right? But it's a good one to get out of because at the end of the day, you have to ask, you know, what, what is the difference between somebody saying a black person can't live in my neighborhood or a woman can't live in my neighborhood and a person who says, you know, a Canadian or Mexican can't live in my neighborhood, right? We all give people the right to buy a house in our neighborhood. Why is that right stop if you happen to be Mexican or Canadian? Right. That's a good point. So, so one point that restrictionists would want to push back on here is that they would want to say, well, it seems common. It seems like it's common sense that we owe more to people who are closer to us. And one spe- one way in which people are closer to us is that they live in the same polity, they're fellow citizens of the United States or Canada or whatever. Then we owe to people who are very distant to us. And they might want to really restrict this notion that we have any moral obligations, we citizens or whatever, to people who aren't citizens. So um, uh, what's your response to that? Yeah, I have a couple of responses. First of all, I would actually agree with some of what these people say, right? You don't owe anything to the person from Mexico. So open borders and free migration doesn't mean you have to give them anything. You owe them nothing. The only thing that you owe them is, is what you owe your neighbor. You don't boss them around and tell them what to do. Same thing from the person from Mexico. You don't boss them around and tell them what to do. In order to appreciate this moral intuition, I use the following example. Let's say you're walking down the street and there's a fire, right? And somebody is trying to get out of the house because their house is on fire. Horrible things will happen to them if they stay in the house. You do not have the moral duty to help that person out of the house right? So if somebody's coming out of the house and they say, please help me, a lot of people would say, you don't, you don't have the duty to help them. And that's even in American law, like you're not required to be a good Samaritan. That's actually a feature of American law. It's also a feature of most morality systems. It may be good to help that person, it may be praiseworthy. We would clap and cheer and say, you're a good person for helping that person and that house that's burning down, but you're not morally required to do that, right? Migration is very similar. So somebody says, you know, I'm coming from Mexico because I live in a neighborhood with gangs or there's warfare or starvation or famine or chronic unemployment. You don't, you're not morally obligated to give that person cash to hire them. You're just obligated to get out of their way. In the same way that if you're walking past a house that's on fire, you don't have to help that guy. The only thing that you're required to do is not push that guy back in. So, On an abstract moral level, I would say, just use common sense. You don't have to actively help the person from Mexico. Just get out of their way, and they'll probably take care of themselves. Now, on a more concrete level, a lot of uh, migration restrictions might have uh, criticisms where they might say, like, look, if they come here, they might use public services, and there's only so much to go around. I think that's, that's not crazy. I think that's a very reasonable criticism to raise, but there's a good response to that. First of all, when you migrate to a country, you start doing things like buying things. And when you buy things, you pay for sales tax. And the sales tax goes to government services. You would also have to rent a house or buy a house. And you pay property taxes for that. And those taxes go into the system. So first of all, there's assumption that migrants are like sponges. That's actually not true. Most migrants are human beings, and human beings like to have jobs. And when they buy things, when they rent homes, when they buy, uh, purchase homes, there's taxation, and that taxation goes into the welfare state. Then a kind of a related issue, if you're really worried that you know, migrants will come in and it'll shock the system, there's a number of very easy ways to account for that without pushing them back into poverty or pushing them back in the country they came from. For example, if you're really worried about, say, uh, university education, right? then you can have a rule and say that people who have not resided in the state, if it's a public school, um, you know, you're at the, currently at the University of Michigan, right? Actually, I, I just graduated. But. Congratulations. So uh, good for you. Excellent. Uh, but you probably know that if you've been in the state for a couple of years, you get a discount compared to people who just arrived, mm-hmm. right? That would apply equally to immigrants and say, look, if you want this sweet deal on education, you're going to have to pay taxes for at least a couple of years. I don't think that's particularly crazy. 
And I think there's a much more humane way to deal with immigration than to push them back into the brooding house. You could think of other alternatives. So for example, if you're really worried about my, migrants uh, straining the tax system, you can say, okay, when they file their federal income tax, and if you legalize them, they will all start filing uh, their tax forms. You can say there's a surcharge, like a 1% surcharge. You know, you, you pay a little bit extra and that will go back into the coffers. So um, there are a couple of intuitions here, which is that some people think that migration is equivalent to charity. That's, no, that's not right. Migration is not charity. Migration is simply getting out of the way. Then if you're really concerned about public services, then you might, then there are a number of very easy, sensible policies that you could use for migration, such as say, you know, you have to live there for a while before you get the discounted rate, or, you know, you might have to pay an extra fee for like $100 a year or something to help, you know, uh, pay for extra public services. So in other words, um, I don't think those people are crazy. I think they bring up good questions, but there's also really good answers. Yeah. So uh, a more technical way of putting that is you, you think that open borders is just recognizing that we do have negative obligations to get out of the way, for example, but not positive obligations. Correct. Yes. That, that, that's, that's what a philosopher would say. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going into philosophy master's programs. So. Oh, excellent. Uh, congratulations. That, that's great. Where are you going to? A uh, Western Michigan. Excellent. Anyway, so let's explore some of the economic sides of this. Right. Because you're making a key point, an empirical point, that immigrants are usually a net benefit to society, right. not just fiscally, but, well, let, let's um, uh, put a pin in the fiscal conversation first, and let's right. just talk about the more macroeconomic consequences. Right. One of the more common uh, responses to open borders is that this will really harm especially low-skill laborers. Right. Within the United States, you know, guys like, is it George Borjas? George Borjas at yeah, Harvard George Borjas at, at Harvard University, really keen to raise this point. So, um, uh, what's your usual response to economic-based more response to those type of objections about labor markets? Right. So there, there's a number of issues that this raises. Number one, you could set, you could ask the question, if migrants were to come in, would they put people out of jobs? Right. So that's that's the basic question. So under a lot of normal circumstances, I really wouldn't be worried about it because if migration were legal, there would be no sudden influx of migration, right? So for example, how many people here worry that uh, Indiana, which shares a border with Michigan, how many people will worry that millions of Hoosiers will move into Michigan and put out put all the people in Michigan out of, out, out of work? And Michigan is a wealthier state than Indiana. It's a much more industrialized place. So if we were really worried about it, we put a giant wall between Michigan and Indiana, but we don't. And why? The reason is under normal economic circumstances, the trickle and flow of workers between these two states is really not that big. Um, but, you know, there are cases where there will be a sudden influx and you can study them. And you mentioned George Borjas, and I'm glad you brought it up because there are two responses to George Borjas. Some people have argued that he made a mistake in his empirical analysis. And we'll get back to that in a second. But let's assume that he didn't, right? And George Borjas is a very meticulous economist. He's actually very well respected within the field of labor economics. So there's very little reason to believe like he would do bad research. In fact, the opposite is true. So what does he do? He says, let's look at the Mariel boat lift. That's when a whole bunch of immigrants from Cuba all of a sudden came over to Miami. And so this creates a great natural experiment. You can say, what's the effect on unemployment and wages on Florida workers when all these Cubans come in literally overnight? So for, for the listeners who may not know about this, in 1980, uh, the Cuban government uh, essentially deported tens of thousands of people in a day. They just shipped all these people over to Florida and kicked them out of Cuba. Now, from an economist perspective or a social science perspective, this is interesting because it creates a nice experiment, right? You could say there's a labor market, this completely random shock happens, and then for a short while, Miami has all these immigrants that other cities didn't have before, right? So it's a great natural experiment. What do people find? Or what did George Borjas find? Well, if you read the paper, you find out the following. Immigration does not affect the wages or the employment of most workers. So that's actually the big point. And he completely bypasses that in talking about it. If you read the paper, for college-educated people um, and people beyond high school, 
there's literally no effect. So that's a case where tens of thousands of people came in, there was no effect. Then for people with less than a high school education, less than a high school education, uh, Borjas estimated that there was a negative effect of about $800 per year. This is from, for, this is from one of his papers and he reports this in his, one of his textbooks, 800 bucks a year. And you might say, oh my God, there's a negative effect. But here, this is where you have to be a philosopher. $800 by itself require, is, is nothing. It requires a moral framework for judgment, right? So you may make $800 more or less, but why you did that and what the relative costs and benefits are equally important, right? So you'd say $800 for a worker in 1980. What is that? You know, factor in inflation that may give you about 1500 bucks or 2000 bucks today, right? Is that noticeable? Yes, it's noticeable. Did it put people into poverty? Probably not. Um, it's probably the cost of a really super nice television set or a fancy vacation somewhere. So it is a real effect. It shouldn't be laughed at or brushed away. But at the same time, it's not catastrophic. But then you have to say, okay, in a moral calculation, you don't look at just the workers in Florida. You look at all the people who came in, right? And those people are doubling and tripling their wages. And if they came from Cuba, they came from a government that might kill them. So I think there's a good argument in that particular case to say, yeah, even though some workers did uh, suffer a small effect in Borjas's calculation, the overall situation is better, right? So it's like, say, importing a bunch of doctors to, say, West Virginia, where there might not be a lot of doctors. Maybe the doctors and the healthcare professionals there might have a slightly lower wage but people are doing better off anyway, right? But there's a second point, which I want to alert readers to, which is that um, Borja's data is public. He's made his data public, his analysis public, and people have noted that he made some very unusual data analysis choices, specifically when he broke down who was included in that uh, low skilled labor category, they start excluding a lot of different types of workers. Maybe his justification is valid. Maybe it's not. I'm not going to make a final judgment on that on a podcast because we'd have to go through all the tables and whatnot. But I will say that other very uh, respected economists have gone through the data and they say, if you re-estimate the regression model uh, using different assumptions, some of those results go away. So what I would say is for people like Borjas, the effect is small, plus, you know, some very reasonable people who've gone through the data have said it's not robust, right? Like you could analyze it slightly differently and get a different answer. But here's the take home point for uh, your listeners, which is that let's assume Borjas is right. I personally would not send a human being to live in communist Cuba. So somebody else could have 800 extra dollars per year. That seems like a very grotesque moral action to me. And so, you know, you have to explain to me why that is a justified action, and I cannot justify it. And that's how a lot of the uh, economics uh, and social science of migration goes, which is that they often find no effect or positive effects of migration. And when you find negative ones, they tend to be small. So that leaves me scratching my head. Like, if this is truly the case, that these negative effects tend to be small in magnitude, why on earth should I send somebody to live in uh, the poverty of rural Mexico or the war-torn country of Syria? So that statistically, not everybody, but just statistically, a few people get a few hundred extra dollars in their annual paycheck. It's a tough moral argument to make in my book. That, that sounds like a particularly strong point. Sticking on Borjas for a second, without getting too deep into the econometric weeds here. Um, Which we can if you really want, but <laughs> I don't know if your readers can tolerate yeah, it. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Anyone outside of, you know, me with an econ degree and me with an economic sociology background would find it too interesting. But without getting too deep into the econometric weeds, if I recall, there was there were also some people who found that that effect disappeared after too long. I think Alexander Narwista has this, you know, theory that influxes in immigration also increase long run aggregate supply over, over the long term, which will then help mitigate the wage effects. Right. And so this gets into a very... Um interesting point about the uh, economics and social science of migration, which is, and this is actually a very basic point, which I think any of your listeners who are interested in social science would appreciate. And the point is this, a human being is not a TV set. 
right? Because if you import a bunch of TV sets, what will happen to the price of TV sets? It'll go down, right? They're all interchangeable. They don't do anything. When you import people, people can do lots of things and they can make the other people more productive, right? So when, you, when people migrate, uh, not only do they buy stuff for themselves, but they work for other people. So like, for example, if I am uh, mowing the lawn because I'm a Mexican migrant and that's the best I can do, that means the guy who's getting their mowed lawn has three extra hours per week to then go be more productive and do something else. Or I'm babysitting that guy's children and they can do more stuff. And so uh, that's kind of the, the underlying intuition about why these effects, even when they're small, why they go away, which is that, you know, society becomes more efficient and more better with more labor options. Right. Labor is more malleable and heterogeneous than consumer products or capitalism. Right. right. And it interacts with other stuff in the, in the market system yeah. in a way that like a TV set doesn't. Like you just have more TV sets and that's it. More hammers or widgets or whatever. But, you know, a human being can come in they can work as a dishwasher, save up a little money, start a taco stand, then maybe open a, a restaurant. Maybe their kid then becomes a doctor or a business owner. And that there's a whole cascade of effects that happens after people migrate, mm -hmm. right? right? And we often completely overlook that. But if you understand that, you, you're like, whoa, that's actually a positive thing to have those people around. Thank you for listening to Mutual Exchange Radio. I just wanted to take a minute to put a quick plug in for the center and all the great works that our writers and scholars do at C4SS. We have a ton of informative studies, articles, and essays and books about market anarchism from our scholars and authors at c4ss.org. For example, you can go to the C4SS store at store.c4ss.org and find two recent books we released, including a print edition of our mutual exchange on anti-fascist praxis called Fighting Fascism, an Anatomy of Escape, an anthology on the rise of the commons featuring the writings of two past MER guests, Kevin Carson and Gary Chartier, as well as other center scholars. You can buy those at store.c4ss.org. We also have a lot of interesting articles coming out regularly on current events, ranging from the rise of alternatives to meat, to an anarchist analysis of Game of Thrones, to the recent phenomena of throwing milkshakes at far-right politicians. You can check all that and more out at c4ss.org. This project and all of the center's work would not be possible without the help of our donors and supporters. In particular, Mutual Exchange Radio is supported by our Patreon. And if you like the show, you can help us by pledging a monthly gift at patreon.com slash c4ss.org. That's c4ss, D-O-T-O-R-G. I'll mention a few more details about how you can help out at the end of the show. Thanks, and now back to my discussion on Open Borders with Fabio Rojas. All right, so let we uh, put a pin in the fiscal issues earlier. Um, let's start diving into that. One of the more common objections you'll hear, especially from people on the right, is that immigrants are going to have a massive a negative effect on welfare. They might cite some studies from the Heritage Foundation, which right. there are major flaws with, I think, to make this point. So what, what's your usual case for why welfare restrictions um, are a great argument against open borders? Yeah, they're pretty bad, actually. They're, they're not effective. So in theory, I can imagine a universe where every um, person who comes in, you know, immediately, you know, takes public benefits. But there's a couple of reasons to think that's a really unrealistic picture. So, for example, um, a lot of public benefits are not even available to immigrants. Like you can't get them until you've been a citizen or you've been a resident for a sufficient period of time. Right. So, for example, Medicare is always a great example. People say, well, you know, people come and, you know, soak money from publicly funded hospitals and whatnot, that's actually factually wrong. It's just like, you know, you cannot get that benefit if you are not a, uh, a resident or a citizen of the United States. It's just part of the law. So a lot of benefits are like that. Number two, um, a lot of people uh, come to work. They don't come as children. So they usually come when they're healthy adults. They're making money. And so they're less likely than the average person to use public assistance, right? Because they already got their education in India or Mexico or Thailand or whatever. They're here to work. So they don't need schooling. It's already done or mostly done when they get here. A third issue is that since they're not using uh, schooling or these other public services, or they're not legally allowed to in some cases, they are still paying taxes, but not using the service very often. So some people have uh, actually documented and estimated that they're net positive for that reason. So in theory, you might imagine they would use all these services, 
but they don't. So if you come at age 23 to work on a farm, you don't need high school. We already did it. And if you're at age 23, you're very healthy. So on the average, you're not going to use medical services. So what are you doing? You're just working and you're paying your taxes, your sales tax, your federal income taxes, different taxes. And on the average, you're not, you're not taking a lot of uh, public services up. Right. And I, I think another point is the moral parity point you raised earlier is that, you know, even if it were true that immigrants were a net loss on the welfare state, like there are a lot of sections of citizen populations that are as well. And we do not think that that is a reason to restrict their liberties in the same way that people right. talk about restrictionists or restrictionists want to talk about immigration. All right. Um, let's move on to one last common objection. Again, this one's, I think, I think, you know, the first two you might hear from left-wing circles, but this last one is the most common from, especially the populist right, which is crime. Mm-hmm. You know, this notion that immigrants are especially, especially likely to be criminal or whatever. And you'll often hear this line from them that like, even if we, even if one crime is committed by an, by an immigrant, it's too much. So what's your typical uh, response to people who are worried about immigration and open borders and its effect on crime? Well, you know, once again, I would say rely on our basic moral intuition. So, for example, would I get rid of all Italian Americans because a few are involved in organized crime? No, no, that people would say that's nutty, and I would agree. Uh, number two, if you're really interested in crime, prosecute crime, right? There's no reason uh, to prosecute people who are not involved at all. And this uh, strikes me as a very important argument because a lot of um, conservative moral uh, philosophy or moral intuition comes from this idea that people are responsible for their own actions, right? They don't blame society, don't blame other people. Well, it goes both ways. That if people are really responsible for themselves, don't punish them for something somebody else did, right? And so, you know, that, that saying that you brought up, uh, you know, even if we just prevent one crime, you know, that'll be worth it. That's not a standard that most people use, right? So for example, um, do men, you know, harm women? They do, right? But we don't deport all men because some men uh, prey on women, right? That, that's nutty. You know, uh, we don't, uh, we can take any group and we can say just because a handful of them commit a crime, uh, we don't deport or get rid of everybody in that group, right? And so that kind of argument, you know, strikes me as very uh, counterintuitive. It's, I don't find it very persuasive. I can see why people would believe it because, you know, crime does happen. Like you could take any group. There are Mexican migrants who've done horrible things. It's absolutely true. But that's not the overwhelming majority of them. And just put yourself in, in, in those shoes. For example, often serial killers are young white men, right? But we don't get rid of all young white men just because a handful of them are doing bad things. It's clearly absurd. So you have to really uh, ask yourself, why are immigrants the exception? Why should we punish the whole country or ban the whole all the immigrants from that country because the actions of a few people? We don't do it for women. We don't do it for people who are already here. We don't do it for a certain gender. And the answer is there is no good reason. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And there's also a lot of social scientific evidence indicating that immigrants are very likely to commit crime as opposed to Yeah, and so we didn't mention, we focus on moral parity, which is, I think, a very crucial thing. But also there's empirics, as you pointed out. Um, so you mentioned Alex Noraste at the Cato Institute. He has a number of working papers that document this very well. The incarceration rates for uh, migrants tend to be very low. And this gets to actually kind of something about... Um, open borders, which is uh, a little bit more subtle, but I think it's very important, which is that migration is essentially a self-selection process. You're not taking the average person from India and you're moving here. That's not what's happening in migration most of the time. Mostly what happens is that people with a little bit more energy, a little bit more uh, intelligence, a little bit more entrepreneurial can-do spirit, they're the ones who are going to say, I'm going to save up money, I'm going to buy a plane ticket, I might try to get into college in the U.S. or in England or Germany, whatever. These are above average. These are people who, are, who want to make it and uh, play by the rules. And that's a self-selection process. So I tell people, like, if you want to make America great again, let immigrants in. Because the ones who will take the effort to come here are above average. And on the average, you're going to pull everybody else up. Another common response to a lot of this um, empirical evidence from restrictionists is that, well, of course, right now, immigrants are going to be, you know, less criminal, 
more industrious, you know, less relying on welfare because we have a robust filtering process for immigration. But if we got open borders, it would get rid of that. And then all these bad effects that they want to imagine will happen. Um, what do you usually respond to that point? Well, there is, I'll, I'll give credit where credit is due, which is uh, there is a kernel of truth. And obviously the kernel of truth is that, you know, the harder you make something, the more elite the person will be who comes out of it, right? So for example, you know, if my physical fitness test requires me to run 10 yards, everybody will do it. But if my physical fitness test is to run 26 miles in a marathon, only the most elite athletes and the healthiest people will do it. Um, but still, even in a, in a situation of open borders, uh, think about how difficult it is to move from to move from one neighborhood to another. Just think about that. So start with the basic thing that you do every day. Think about moving from one neighborhood, uh, say from Bloomington up to Ann Arbor, right? That by itself, you know, is a great screen. That by itself requires a lot of time and effort. You know, I've actually done it myself. I was a postdoctoral fellow at Ann Arbor for a couple of years. And so, you know, I have to save up some money to pay, you know, for a down payment for a house or for an apartment. Um, then you have to get, you have to get movers. You have to understand how things work. It's unless, you know, it's like a, a war torn refugee kind of a situation. You know, most migration will select up for people that, who have their act together because people who are really not together are not going to be able to save up the money. They're not going to be able to learn a new language. They're not going to say, yeah, I'm going to go to a new country and learn their ways and start a business and become a productive member of society. Those things are actually uh, rare skills and migration filters out for the people who tend to have that. Yeah. I, so your point is that even if you get rid of legal restrictions, it's not as if moving halfway across the world is something cost us. Right. We don't. So in other words, Maybe if you lived in Star Trek and they could push a button and randomly move people around, you might have a point. But in the real world, my, even moving across the street, like if you bought a house in the same neighborhood and you had to move down the street, that requires a lot of effort, right? And so it'll continue to be like that for the foreseeable future. All right. Let, let us talk about, well, one last objection uh, before, before we move on to another topic related to this. Another common canard you'll hear from restrictionists is, well, I'm only opposed to legal immigration, not legal immigration. What right. And so my response is, well, let's legalize it. If you really think you know, it should be legal, let's legalize it. And, you know, you should just ask people like, you know, just ask them a concrete number to say, you know, how many people should be allowed in, right? And or it's just simply ask, you know, can we just add 10% to what we have already? And if they are really, truly concerned about people breaking the law and they recognize the law is broken to start with, I think a humane person would say, OK, maybe I'm not going to take the jump to go to open borders. Maybe that's a little bit radical, but I'm willing to meet you part of the way. So if they say, yeah, maybe you could increase migration, you know, 10 or 15 percent or something, then that shows me that they're really concerned about uh, the well-being of other people. Right. But if you even say, given our relatively low, and we only accept something with like 700,000 people from around the world per year. So out of 7 billion, you know, we basically uh, authorize migration for less than 1%, right? Of the entire global population. I'm making sure I'm counting my zeros. No, it's much less than 1%, right? But anyway, but it's a very small fraction of the world's population that we authorize for immigration each year. And that's not 700,000 from one country. That's 700,000 spread across the world. So if you're in a country with low, uh, low demand for migration, like, say, a Luxembourg, you're not going to use your quota. A lot of people from Mexico, they're not going to be able to come. And so, you know, given the relatively low level of migration, if you say, you say, you know, not that many people can legally migrate as it is. Could you increase that? Could you make it a little bit easier? Um, so for example, you know, I'll even ask, what about dreamers? Like they've already shown that they're productive members of society. They've already shown that, you know, they're, they're playing by the rules. They were brought here by the parents. There's no fault around. If that person cannot even, um, meet you halfway on something as simple as that, that indicates to me that they're truly not interested in, uh, the illegality issue. They're really kind of have some sort of personal issue with people from other countries.
Um, but then they say, okay, we can legalize that because that's not even migration anymore. If, you, if you're just saying there's a group of a couple hundred thousand people or a million people and you're uh, legalizing them and they've already been here, that's not really migration or even open borders in the way that you and I have been discussing it. So if they can't even meet you halfway on that, that suggests to me they're not really interested in good law and productive law. They just kind of want to set up one barrier against the other. The other example I might use is uh, refugees and asylum applicants, you know, where uh, these are people who maybe don't want to migrate, but the only reason they're here is because their house is on fire. And if you can't even, you know, legalize or facilitate their entry in some way, that shows me that uh, the well-being of other people is not really high on your priority list. And we could have a discussion about that. Right. Um, one clarifying point that I think is worth bringing up in this and at this point is, do you think open borders is just like this, a, dis a point of linguistic confusion that sometimes emerges in these discussions? Do you think open borders is just like a wor word for the most radical solution of no immigration restrictions at all? Or do you think there's room for the movement to include more liberalizing immigration reformers who maybe don't go full stop? Yeah, I mean, I'm a very, um, very uh, pragmatic person. I openly recognize that uh, what I'm proposing is radical. Like my, my own personal opinion about what a good and sensible policy is very extreme compared to the average American, right? But at the same time, you know, I'm a believer in working with other people. You know, you can't have social change by yourself. You and your friend can't go off to a room and have a party by yourself and expect everybody to pay attention. But instead, you should really think about where are some constructive ways you can engage people who don't completely buy what you say or people who are of good heart, but, you know, they're just on the other side of this issue. And so what I would say is, you know, open borders, it doesn't have to be like a doctrine. Uh, maybe it's a motto. So, you know, borrowing from uh, President Clinton, I want to make uh, migration safe, legal, and common. You know, so just that's it. You know, we could argue, we could quibble about it, but if it's safe, legal, and easy to do, that's what we're talking about. So if some people say, I want to talk about dreamers, like, great. Or if you're a business person and you want to facilitate more high school workers to your job or more low school workers to your business, we could talk about that too. Uh, I'm interested in anything that moves the needle in my direction. So... Another objection that comes to mind when we're discussing more liberal immigration reformers who maybe don't go full open borders. I think this is a point raised by, you know, Ezra Klein. And uh, I once attended a talk at Michigan State with Mike Humer, where there was a political scientist pushing this point, is that, look, given the political reality of the United States today, having open borders would issue in such demographic change that there might be a backlash by nativists that would be destabilizing to political institutions. And they think that this is a very, very good reason to be hesitant about mass levels of immigration. They might say like, look, just demographic change among the composition of US citizens has caused this, you know, populist right wing backlash. Do we really want, you know, open borders to accelerate that? Yeah, I, I've heard that. And one, as you, you might not be surprised, I'm not persuaded. And there are a couple of reasons to not be persuaded. First of all, on a moral level, you shouldn't be persuaded. Because once you realize that there's uh, no moral reason to, um, to push people back into Mexico or Syria or India, that, you know, discriminating against them is no different than discriminating against blacks or Jews or women, um, then you quickly realize, don't give in to bullies. You know, if you give in to bullies one, at one point, they're going to they're gonna ask for more, right? So, you know, uh, maybe, you know, when we did immigration reform in the 1960s, it kind of opened it up where we kind of gave the restrictionists some tools and they slowly ratcheted down little by little, increased the deportations, increased the visa requirements, increased all this stuff little by little over time. So um, I would argue to the reverse that once you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. Um, and I, definitely uh, in terms of my own ethical perspective, I see myself as an abolitionist. You know, like this is a fundamentally rotten system. Uh, there's no way to uh, get around that fact. It's a system that keeps people in poverty. It's a people system that puts people in danger. And then also, I would say historically, from the beginning of the American Revolution, when this country got started up until the uh, 1920s, when we essentially closed the door, I don't remember any political upheaval around immigration. People complained, 
right? So there's a lot of complaint, a lot of anti-immigrant politics. That we had for sure in large amounts, but it's not like we had a civil war over immigration. It's not like the federal government collapsed because of immigration. In fact, you know, basically we just saw a lot of grumbling. And these concerns, people bring this up about the destabilization. Basically, when I read the evidence, I hear a lot of complaining, but I don't see a lot of destabilization. Like, I I didn't see Washington go up in flames when all those Russians and Jews came in the 1800s. I didn't see New York collapse in the ocean because Italian Americans came over. California has had millions of Mexican immigrants, and it's still doing fine, right? So when I hear those stories, I'm uh, first of all, on a moral level, I, I don't really buy them because I don't believe in giving in to bullies. But second of all, uh, historically, when we look at the U.S. and other places, it's very rare that you look at the history book and say, man, that disaster could have been World War I, the Civil War, the Great Depression. That all could have been avoided if we just prevented Irish people from coming to our country. Like nobody ever reads a history book like that, Right. So even though in theory I could imagine some big backlash, basically uh, my reading of the evidence is that you see a lot of cultural talk back and uh, no real crisis. It's just in people's imaginations for the most part. And there's not a lot of evidence that that would actually happen or has happened. And I, I think another way to drive home that point about not giving in to bullies is these are very analogous to the types of arguments that people who wanted to conservatively defend segregation or slavery used to get. Like if you really believe that immigration restriction as you do, and I'm on board with this is a moral wrong, then like the fact that some white feelings will be hurt by getting rid of that moral wrong. Isn't like a persuasive reason. To keep, right. Like a white backlash isn't a good reason to keep people in refugee camps starving to death. Right. Exactly. In much the same way that you would say, um, I feel aggrieved because a black family moved in my na- neighborhood. You would say, well, you're going to have to grow up a little bit. It's okay <laughs> if a black person is your neighbor. It's okay if there's a taco truck down the street. It's okay. It's not a bad thing. Tacos right. are great. You should have some. <laughs> I think anybody who disagrees with that is, uh, is, is uh, unreasonable in their political opinions and their aesthetic ones. So, um, That the tacos are good. But let's move on to a bit more of the logistics about how we would bring about a future with more open immigration, with uh, something resembling open borders. Most of your your sociological research is in the formation and growth of political movements. Correct. Um, So how does that shed light on your work in, say, like the anti-war movement or in the black, black power turning to black studies shed light upon uh, what immigrant, what open borders advocates and immigration reformers should do going forward. Right. So there's a couple of things to know. Uh, First of all, that change is long-term. It's it's a long-term business. Um, It is very rare that a big political issue will abruptly change in your lifetime. Usually issues change because people have been working at it for like decades. I was really impressed by this when I read the history of the American Civil Rights Movement that, you know, depending on, you know, how you, how you measure it, it starts like in 1896 or 1905. Uh, the Plessy versus Ferguson case, for example, was actually a test case designed to overturn segregation, but it kind of backfired on them. But the, there was a group of citizens in New Orleans that wanted to overturn segregation on transportation. So we know from the records that, like, these activist groups have been around. The Niagara Conference run by W.E. Du Bois you know, that starts in 1905, I believe. And so, and that took decades until you saw the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s, like 50, 60 years. So uh, when I did an interview for uh, Vox, the Effective Altruist podcast, um, you know, they had a counterpoint to me. There was a gentleman uh, who responded, he was a, he was a Democratic uh, uh, activist, Democratic Party activist who worked in Congress and he was an attorney. And basically they asked him like, what's the deal with open borders? And he's like, well, that, that's uh, really just not on the table. You know, it's just like, this is not something that, that can, you know, I could do anything with. And actually, I would, I would agree. You know, I don't see my job as uh, changing uh, American society overnight. However, I do see one thing that I can do is setting, setting a path where just little by little, we start reorienting people, start educating people, start getting the ideas out there. So maybe 40 or 50 years from now, 
that political activist or his counterparts in the future will say, you know what, that was a crazy idea in 2018, but in 2048, it's a different picture. So here's a really great example. Um, during the 2016 campaign, Bernie Sanders, the senator from Vermont, came out and said, open borders is a part of a Koch conspiracy. Okay. Um, that made me happy. The fact that he said that because before you could even say open borders. Now at least he thinks it's, a, it's an evil right wing conspiracy, right? And so that's the kind of progress I see where like 10 years ago, if you set, went up and said, hey, you know, um, we deported 400,000 Mexican migrants. You know, people go, okay, right? They, they wouldn't have an emotional reaction. But now somebody like Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez, she even talked about abolishing ICE for a while. Sadly, she didn't go through with it. I think she dropped the issue. But even the fact that she even mentioned it is phenomenal progress. I even love it when conservatives trash open borders. So for example, uh, the editor of National Review, Rehan Salam, who's a very talented writer, a really wonderful magazine editor. His, um, the subtitle of his book is called A Child of Immigrants Comes Out Against Open Borders. I'm like, yes, you're talking about us. And so like at first I felt really bad, like man, you know, this very prominent writer is uh, critiquing one of my favorite things. But then after a while I realized this is actually good, like we can talk about it. So now like, you know, Vox talked about this. And the other day, uh, I Zach started Beachman collecting Vox. articles. Hmm? Zach Beachman Vox is, I think, even a supporter of Open Borders. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it was on Vox. Time Magazine ran a column by Brian Kaplan. Um, uh, Jeffrey uh, Milio, Milio or Milo, the uh, economist of Harvard, wrote for USA Today, arguing for Open Borders. Um, I've done the Vox podcast, and I've written for various websites, and we're doing this podcast, and I've spoken at campuses. You know, so the point is, you know, now people are paying attention. And even though still most people think I'm really off the deep end, more and more people are willing to actually think about it and say, I may not agree with that. Let, let me give you a really super duper concrete example. A couple of weeks ago, maybe about two months ago, I was giving a talk here at Indiana University uh, for their continuing learning series. This is where you pay for, for lectures and you come and you do like a seminar on different topics. And the speaker said, Professor Rojas is a specialist in social movements, and that's what we'll talk about. Also, he's known for advocating open borders. So I did my talk, and then we got the Q&A, and this uh, elderly lady raises her hand and says, I can't believe you're here. And I, I said, could you explain? And she wasn't being mean. She said, I have never heard anybody say open borders out loud. Like, I've never even heard of the concept till you talked about it a couple of minutes ago. And that lady talked about it. Because if I said that amongst my friends, people would throw rocks at me. Right? Exactly. So she lives in a world where this isn't even conceivable. And, you know, this even gets to a kind of a deep sociological point. There was a sociologist, a very well-known one named Pierre Bourdieu. And he had this great uh, analysis of speech. He said... Uh, you know, there's heterodox speech and orthodox speech. So orthodoxy sticks to the party line. The heterodox does not stick to the party line. But even then, beyond those two camps, there is stuff beyond that. And he called that non-doxic speech. So doxa is the stuff you're allowed to talk about. And then there's the stuff you could talk about, but you don't because it's not conceivable in that cultural landscape. So one of my jobs in the short number of days that God gives me to walk on this earth is to move the open borders concept from non-doxa, stuff that, is, that you can't even think of, is conceptually off the board, you don't even get it, to at least make it a heterodox, where people know what it is, they just don't agree with it. And then maybe uh, our children, or somebody else in the future, and I hope you have many great children, they will pick up the mantle, they'll make that orthodoxy. You know, they'll move it back. So in terms of concrete politics, I always start with ideas first, which is, you can't have a movement on something nobody understands. Like you need to get a, a group of people who understand the concept, they believe in it, they think it's worth doing, and then to build things out. So like I'm a teacher, I'm a professor. So that means I'm good at writing and I'm good at speaking. So I do podcasts, I do blogging, I'll do tweeting. Um, we have the Open Borders Conference in New York City in 2019. 
And the American Sociological Association just approved a panel on open borders for 2020. So little by little, I'm doing the little bits that I can to move uh, open borders from stuff you can even conceptualize to stuff that we can start debating. So we'll get into more like nitty gritty what people who maybe don't have a comparative advantage in academia like you and I think I do in a minute. But one of the things you've discussed in your articles in the past is how to how to make it more pal- more accessible to the general public. Um, push this Overton window more in that in the open borders direction by changing how we frame the issue. Right. So it was easy throughout all those objections. Like I was objecting from people who seem to think about, you know, borders is like constraining their house. And they think about like the country is this big house and you're allowing you can come in and out of the house. So what's an alternative way of framing open borders you think uh, that is less appealing on that intuitive level? Yeah. Or more appealing on that intuitive level. Right? right. So that's why when I do uh, public speaking, I start out with intuitions. You know, so for example, there's a reason that when we started this conversation, I talked about the border between Chicago and Indiana, right? Like it's already there. People move between it all the time and we're okay with it, Right. So rather than attacking you and saying, look, you're wrong, or to give you a very sophisticated argument, I just start with a very simple intuition. I say, you know, look, there are a lot of borders that are very important borders, right? And they matter, yet people can move across them. Um, Another thing I start with is I would say, you know, just as it would be wrong to uh, tell a black person they can't move into your neighborhood, it's wrong to say that a person from another country can't move into your neighborhood. And even though they may not completely agree with that, at least it's something they can get into. Um, you could also tell them that immigrants are people who buy stuff so they could go to your business, right? They could be working at your gas station, right? And that's a good thing. We need people to do that. So in terms of people, uh, whether it be an academic such as yourself or myself, or if you're just a regular person uh, talking about public issues, Always start out with basic intuitions that people can understand because that that matters the most, right? Most people will not be persuaded by an econometric argument or dissection of what George Borjas wrote in you know, the Journal of Labor Economics or something like that. Um, that's right. valuable. It's an important part of knowledge, but that's just not the way most people work. Instead, most people need a basic intuition, right? And so when you look through the history of abolitionism or the history of different movements, the ones that are successful are the ones that think really, really carefully about what their basic metaphor is or their basic intuition is, right? Um, and then these more sophisticated arguments come later. So that's, those are things I would start off with, like look at borders that are already open, right? Um, look at uh, all the ways immigrants can help you, which are very easy to explain, right? And start from there. And those are good places to start. All right. And what are things that more on the ground people can do who maybe aren't engaged in this battle of ideas, uh, whether it be political action or direct action and stuff like that? Right. Exactly. So there's there's a number of things that people can do. Um, You know, once again, you're not obliged to do this if you don't want to do it. That's okay. Everybody has the uh, their life to lead as they see fit. But if you're really interested in activism, there's a number of things you could do. For example, there's a sanctuary movement. And the sanctuary movement is all about taking people who are in the crosshairs of the immigration system and give them give them a safe space. Sometimes, usually not always, but they're often religious spaces. Like the police will respect religious spaces. So maybe if you belong to a church, you could volunteer, maybe cook that person a meal, right? Maybe if you are um, you know, a public service provider, like a doctor or a teacher or something, you could help out these immigrants who are in sanctuary. Because when you're in sanctuary, you're very vulnerable because you can't leave. That means you don't have a job, you don't have money, and you need people to help you. Um, so that's like something simple that like like your everyday person can do, like cook a meal for somebody in sanctuary or take their kid to school. Like if you're the adult, your kid may be a U.S. citizen, but you may be uh, under threat of deportation. You know, help out with their kids. Donate money to the church that supports them. Donate to the lawyer that's doing pro bono work to help them uh, not get deported, right? So that's like a very simple thing you could do. Um, Publicity is always a good thing, right? 
So one thing I do, for example, is a Facebook group called the Open Borders Action Group. And a lot of our members, they'll just post stories. I'm also in it. Yeah. They're, they're, they'll, they'll post stories of people who are in sanctuary, people who've been targeted by the system, or unfortunately, even people who've died in detention. You know, so you can publicize things. Then, of course, there are some more radical activists who want to go and do more direct action. Um, this comes at risk to yourself, so maybe it's not appropriate for everybody. You may have a moral compunction against it. Maybe, you know, you think this is wrong. But there are some activists who will do things like they'll try to prevent people from getting arrested or deported. They will try to, um, you know, they'll do things like they'll surround the vans that go and pick up people. They'll go to detention centers and hold a protest in front of it and that sort of thing. They'll try to kind of disrupt the system in one way or another. They'll run a hose into a lawyer's office for ICE or something like that. Right, exactly. So, uh, you know, we can have a debate about whether that's uh, morally good or not, or we could discuss its efficacy. But people do do it, you know, and, you know, it's, um, you know, something that's important to think about. Yeah, preview of coming attractions because I, I believe C4SS is planning a mutual exchange on that topic soon. All right. Um, we always like to close out this podcast by asking, what are three uh, books on immigration, open borders, or anything really generally that have been really influential about over your thought? Oh, right. You know, I, you know, I came to this issue during the age of blogs and social media. <laughs> so right. I, I, I will put out a couple of, po- I'll put out a couple of positive things. First of all, I am the editor of a magazine called Context, and that's the official magazine of the American Sociological Association. Our upcoming issue is on migration and includes one open borders argument in it. And that will be free when it comes out. You can download for that free for 30 days. Then you wait a year and it becomes free again. There's a paywall for a short while. But the point is, um, we asked um, Jonathan Ports, the economist at King's College in London, to write an article about the economics of migration. He wrote a very wonderful article. And at the end of it, he says, if you look at all the benefits and the limited uh, negative externalities of migration, should we move towards open borders? He actually raises that question. Um, and then a number of the other articles written by sociologists who talk about the damaging effects of migration enforcement. So even though it hasn't been influential on me, because I was the editor who put it together, these are really excellent scholars um, really talking about, you know, it's not just about immigrant rights, but blowing open the whole system. Could we roll this back in some way? Number two, Brian Kaplan, uh, the economist, who's a great friend of mine, and Zach Wienersmith, who is a comic uh, book illustrator and artist who writes something called Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial. They are co-writing a graphic novel called Open Border, The Science and Ethics of Immigration, which is a full, it's wonderful. I've seen parts of it. Uh, Brian gave a presentation um, about it at the first Open Borders Conference last year in October. So that book is really uh, going to come out and it's going to be fabulous. Um, There are other authors who've written books uh, on migration, such as Jason Brennan, the the, uh, philosopher of Georgetown. Um, In Defense of Openness, I believe. Yeah, Defense of Openness. There is the, um, oh gosh, the philosopher in Canada who defended open borders in a number of early articles. What is his name? This will come to me later. Let's see. Uh, Ilya Soman at George Mason, Alex Narasti at the Cato Institute. So, you know, there are a number of people uh, writing about this in uh, various ways. And so uh, I would recommend all those resources. There's also a website called openborders.info, which I've contributed to a little bit. It's kind of, a, kind of in a dormant state right now, but you go through the archives and read all the arguments about open borders. So there's a lot of good stuff that you can get into, and it's just going to get better over time. All right. Well, uh, thank you for coming on the podcast today. Uh, This was a great discussion, and I hope to see more from you on this topic in the future. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode of Mutual Exchange Radio. I'd like to thank Dr. Rojas again for a really fascinating and in-depth discussion of Open Borders. I hope you found it as interesting as I did. Until next time, you can find us at patreon.com slash c4ss.org. That's c4ss, D-O-T-O-R-G. From there, you can support this podcast and other C4SS projects by making a monthly pledge of $5 or more. Plus, we've extended the opportunity to be listed as an associate producer on the show. Anyone who pledges $10 or more before June 15th will get a shout-out on the credits of Episode 6,
and those who pledge $20 or more will gain access to additional content from our guests and scholars. For example, recently the staff of our show did a Patreon-only roundtable discussion of topics such as the U.S.'s foreign policy approach to Iran and the network security and economic implications of the U.S. government's efforts against Chinese telecommunications company Huawei. That uh, discussion will be released in the coming days. Also, keep an eye out as in the next month we are looking at ways to reduce prices and make it a lot easier and cheaper for you to support us on Patreon. That should all be announced within the next few weeks, as well as new announcements such as giving out bonus swag as a thank you for signing up. Thank you for your support and look out for more fun prizes for our Patreons coming soon. Finally, a special thanks to our current associate producers, Derek W., David Colburn, Wendy Stoileroff, James Tuttle, Ceci Jamal, Agnerals, Cecil Dion, and Danny O'Brien. I hope you join us next month as we have former Chelsea Manning campaign manager and a center affiliated writer, Kelly Wright, on to discuss the various ways that the state goes after various political movements, including grand juries and the Aspen Hot Jack. Thanks again for listening.